everyone. I'm glad to be here and share with you the work I conducted with my advisor, Sue Fussell from Cornell. And in this research, we explore the dynamic of language use by non-native speakers in multilingual teams. So before we get into the detail of this study, let's first look at some of the study that tell what HCI scholars already know about language use in multilingual team. So this research is important because it serves as a foundation where our current research is built on. So in, in today's society, we know that communication has become global. So in both industrial and academic settings, we see increasing number of multilingual teams where people speaking different native language, like what we see today, coming here together to solve the common problem. Then multilingual speakers usually encounter, uh, those teams encounter language-related problems that really happen in monolingual teams. So in the work in the field of HCI, we see two main streams of work that are trying to facilitate multilingual teamwork by, help, by helping teams overcome those language barriers. So in the first line of, of research, people try to focus on those traditional scenarios where everybody is required to speak, for example, English as a common language to communicate. So we know in those cases, non-native speakers, because of their lack of fluency, they usually run into communication problem. So researchers look at how different technology, such as speech recognition, like what we're doing at this section now, can help non-native speakers catch up with the English conversation better. Then another line of work explores the possibility of allowing everyone using their own native language but still talk with each other. So here, people mainly dig into the scenario of how machine translation technology can be applied into supporting those real-time conversation. And those study coming up some, with some very interesting design applications, helping people make the best use of those imperfect translation outputs. So here, when we're reviewing and uh, reflecting on those, those studies, one thing we notice very interesting is that all those studies seem to be bounded by some pre-assumption. So for example, they tend to assume that either people always prefer to stay with English as a common language to talk, or people always prefer to use their native language to speak with each other. But how about when those pre-assumptions are challenged? How about when we look at multilingual teamwork from a more dynamic social perspective, where people really need to rely on a lot of ongoing information scattered in the context to make those on-the-fly judgment of what language they want to use and what are the technology they need to support those language use. So those reflections shape the motivation of the current study that is trying to add in those missing knowledge in previous kite work. OK, so what has been missing in previous study? From both anecdotal experience and very limited previous empirical evidence, we sense that people in multilingual teams, they do not always stick with one single language to communicate about everything. But sadly, to date, we still have very little knowledge accumulated that tell us the contextual aspects of language use in terms of, for example, when will a non-native speaker choose one language over the other to do the conversation, why they do that, and how they do that. So here, we're arguing that figuring out the answer to this question are actually very important for building future HCI research because those answers will guide our design decision in terms of what type of technology we want to provide at what type of timing and how we can insert those technology into the work context to support the most natural and fluid working conversation. So here, driven by those motivations, we conduct the current research trying to understand the contextual aspects of language use in multilingual teams. Uh, two research questions driven our current study. One of them is, when and why do members of multilingual teams using their native language instead of a common language and vice versa at work? And secondly, how do members of multilingual teams balance the value and cost, if any, of using their native language versus a common language? Then uh, we select to use an in-depth field study to conduct this research. We work with three volunteer teams, which are all multilingual teams. So they're all using English as the only shared, shared common language to communicate. But also for each team, there are subgroups of people who speak different native language that is not English. So here, while the study is going on, me as a researcher go to sit in those workspace with those teams and spend over 100 hours with them during the whole process of study. And while I'm sitting there, I try to collect three types of data. So firstly, taking notes of people's um, behavior in terms of how they use language. 
And then I go to talk with people and listen to their retrospection in terms of their concerns, motivation, and interpretation regarding why everybody wants to do that language choice in those conversations. And certainly, if um, the conversation is happening online and after we get people's permission, we're trying to keep a conversation log of those uh, chats for analytical purpose. So the reason why we want to go through such a complicated process to construct this research is because we're really trying to keep those most juicy and vivid contextual information regarding people's language choice. And we know those information is usually very hard to be fully recalled if we run other type of methods, for example, a lab study or a context independent survey or interview. Then after each stage of the data collection, we go through this iterative process guided by the grounded theory, try to analyze the data. And here we find some very interesting results. So in a summary, what we find is language shift or say the behavior that non-native speakers shifting back and forth between using their native language and using English in this case to conduct a work conversation um, emerge as a central theme that described the way how, pe how people communicate in multilingual teams. And then more, more specifically, we see this language shift happen repeatedly across different conversational contexts. For example, including face-to-face -face informal conversation, formal meetings, also face-to-face, -face, and also online instant messaging. And further, interestingly, we see in the data that there is a unique pattern of how people conduct language shift attached to the conversation happened under each specific context. So here, I'm going to use face-to-face -face informal conversation as an example to demonstrate to you guys the mechanism of language shifting in terms of when, why, and how people choose different language. Okay, so informal conversation. It refers to the type of communication that happened in the workspace where people come up together to have those unplanned, spontaneous chat with each other. And from tens of previous CCW and HCI work, we know that informal conversations usually serve as a major venue that help people like building relationship, sharing information, and also cultivating the team culture of this working group. So while I'm going to collect the data and, analyze, and analyzing those data, we see um, hundreds of cases where those people in multilingual teams doing language shifting during a formal conversation. Then as a summary of our finding, we see the language shifting, going back to our previous uh, research question, usually happens in associate with participants' role shift in the conversation. And also people conduct language shifting because they're trying to achieve both the grounding efficiency and maintain the social appropriateness of their conversation action. And also we notice that participants try to make the best use of shift markers and also pay attention to different role indicators while they're trying to decide which language to use. So I guess you don't really understand what those terms mean at this moment. And here I'm going to show you two cases that tell you the contextual meaning of those terms. So here, the first case is, I call that a case of a technical discussion start in a multilingual team. So this case is talking about one of the day I sit in the workspace of this team. So currently there are four people sitting there. Am I mouse here? Okay, nice. So among these four people, we see A, B, C are three people sitting around the same table, starting a conversation in English. And D is someone working remotely from the, well, not that remotely, because it's still in the same workspace, on her own documentation. So among A, B, and C, A, B are two, per two people who share the same native language. So for example, Mandarin. But C doesn't know that language at all. Then one interesting thing I see is, at some moment, B start to issue this sentence. She says, give us a few minutes, we will go into discuss this in, for example, Mandarin. And then from that moment on, A and B start a sub-consequence of conversation only in Mandarin while C is still standing beside them. And this conversation get ended until A says, okay, we just find a solution, then everybody go back to speaking English again. You, you may find this scenario familiar in your workplace, right? So then I was wondering, what really happened from a language shifting perspective would really drive people to make those different language choice during the conversation. And then by putting together my observation notes, my interview with people, and by revising previous literature in psychology and communication, here is what I figured as a mechanism. Let's start over again. So at the beginning of the conversation, we see ABC start a chat in English. So the reason why they choose English to start a conversation is based on how they interpret each participant's role in the conversation. So for example, 
at the moment B started speaking, this action marked herself automatically as a speaker. And then because of A and C have really close physical distance with B, and also because the three people are constantly sharing gaze interaction and tension with each other, those explicit role indicator marked A and C as two addressing the conversation. So A, B, and C, they're both central participants here. Then the reason why they want to use English to start a conversation is because they are trying to use a language that can properly include all the central participants here and to reach a common ground. But interestingly, nobody bothers thinking about that for D because there's no explicit role indicator marked D as a central participants here. Then at some moment, what really happened here is A and B run into a grounding problem. They're trying to discuss a technical question, but nobody, neither of them know how to say some of the terms in, um, in English. But they know there's no problem for them to ground in that in Mandarin. So then from that moment on, they started to have a strong tendency to shift to Mandarin. But this shifting what's happened will lead to a very interesting consequence is it's potentially change C's role there. So that is to say, because C will no, will we'll not be able to understand the conversation anymore. She is actually going to be turned into an overhearer, although those explicit role indicators still mark her as addressee. So to solve this conflict, we see A and B issue this two sentence, what we call a language shift marker. And the social function those markers play here is trying to hold C's role here to tell her that we still respect your role in this conversation. We try to include you, although we want to ground some information in Mandarin quickly. So from this example, what we see is people are trying to fulfill two goals here in the conversation, one regarding the social appropriateness and the other regarding the grounding uh, efficiency. So these are two things that drive people moving back and forth between using different language. And they keep monitoring those explicit role indicator while they choose different languages. So here, they use language shift marker as a technique, trying to make the best use of using different languages. But when the conversation starts in a monolingual teams, the story can be a little bit different. So here is why I want to introduce you with another cases. So in this cases, again, we see there are four people sitting in the workspace. But this time, A and B are two people sharing the same native language, talking together in their mother tongue. And then C and D, they don't know that language, they're sitting a bit far away. Then at some moment, what I see is something interesting like this. So B suddenly says to A, like, are you going to the talk on Wednesday? The talk is about blah, 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 the topic. It's relevant to the studies in our group. And A replied in English, yeah, I would definitely be there. So this time I was thinking, there's no third person joining this talk suddenly, but why they decided to shift a language. And then again, by putting everything together, what we figured is, so at the beginning, as the first case you see is all those explicit role indicator marks people's role as central participants and those peripheral participants. But then while A and B are speaking, they're going through something in their mind as what we call an implicit role indicator. That is to say, they're trying to constantly matching the topic of the conversation with their knowledge regarding everybody's uh, point of interest in their work. Then once B figured there's something worth sharing with everybody in this workspace, she suddenly changed language. And the use of implicit marker, uh, um, a row indicator, caused a problem. That is, because those implicit indicator just going on in A and B's mind, it's not something visually, publicly can be aware by everybody in the workspace. It's caused a phenomenon that we call asymmetric interpretation. So here, by talking with C and D, we know that these two people are actually experiencing a great sense of unease because they know they're totally excluded from the decision of what is the language to use at this moment. Because they don't know N and B's mother language, there is no way for them to estimate should we be included in the conversation or not. And also because of those social regulation, they also cannot just stand up and go to NB and say, hey, uh, can you guys just please switch to English to continue the conversation because we want to know what they're talking about. So here, in this case, it's again, although it's a slightly different form, we still see people are trying to balance the uh, use of different language achieving both conversational ground efficiency and maintain a social properness. But this time, because they're using the implicit indicator, it caused a problem as metric interpretation. So here we also look at 
um, how those language shifting happen in other scenario, for example, formal meetings, instant messaging, and also language shifting across contexts. We don't have time to go through all of them today, but I would encourage you to read those, my paper uh, co-author with Sue for more details because they all indicate some very different mechanism comparing with informal uh, conversation in the workspace. But to sum up in general, what we find is language choice in the actual practice of teamwork is full of fluidity. People do not really go with a either English or not English paradigm. And also that indicates the importance of, for us to understand how people make language choice based on their situational needs related to each context. So those findings indicate some very interesting space for us to do some future design work in the field of HCI. And here I'm going to outline three points of them for you to consider. So like the first point I list here is future HCI research may want to think about how technology can be designed to help people dig out those information, proper information from contacts and propping them to the speaker to assist them make a better decision of language choice in a given moment. And secondly, when people need to move back and forth between different languages, can we do something from a technical perspective to help them smoothing this transition? And thirdly, because we see those information regarding to the same topic sometimes sc scattered uh, at, across different language media, language channel, then can we do anything to help people make a better information management or integration across those info scattered at different channels? Um, this research is funded by NSF grants, and we thank Leslie Sanyang, who is sitting there, and also Alex for their assistance in this research. We also thank the anonymous teams for their support and our reviewers for their fantastic feedback. So if you have questions, comments about this study, now is the time to share it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carla from Université Paris-Sud and INRIA. Um, I was wondering, how do you think that your findings fit in, for example, a Sky conference call, where probably a lot of um, people from that speak different languages are together, but their presence are, is very explicit? Their presence is very explicit. Okay. Yeah, uh, for example, you were talking about these people that are like overhearers mm -hmm. and people that are supposed to be your, your main interactor, but in, in a Skype conversation, maybe that's less, um, like it's more explicit. Okay, so thank you very much for this question, because I think it actually covers something I have no time to mention in the presentation. So if I, you remember, I mentioned in this study, we actually look at three different type of contacts in terms of how people communicate. And then I think comparing that with the case of those Kai, this Kai conference, it will cover actually all the three aspects. So for example, in those coffee break, what we see is people have informal face-to-face -face conversation where those communication is full of flexibility, which may fit more into the context of what I described in the two cases here. But in the ongoing talk, for example, or in those Kai um, formal meetings, those conversation paradigm go in another way. And here what we see from my field data is formal meetings when people do a language shift is actually more driven by what type of content they're speaking there rather than who they perceive as the participants. Because in those cases, there is a lot of regulation in terms of what could be talked about in those meetings, what language you need to use as a norm. But in the informal chatting, maybe we don't have that norm. And then I believe there will also be some online channels. People are going to communicate with each other during the conference, both online and offline. Online, online in terms of whether in a, at the conference or out of the conference. And then in those scenarios, we figure that the platform they're going to use for supporting those conversations largely shape uh, how they use language. So I think in terms of having a big conference, this is also considered a, of a lot of different scenarios together. But in our study, we try to see that uh, for those different scenarios, they actually follow different rules. And uh, I will be interested in to use some of the findings we get from this study to construct some like experience sampling study and set that into the conference setting to see how much the, those findings can be uh, repeated 
in those different contexts. So I think that's definitely a future direction of work I will want to try based on the current study. So thank you for this great question. <laughs> we can always talk after the presentation. So. Hi, my name is Anthony with Cornell. Um, interesting talk. I wanted to uh, ask a little bit about the context in which you studied these teams. Was it really a professional context? And I wonder if you think it might matter in uh, professional contexts, you have a very you know, established culture about how you should act in that context. If you were in a more informal context where um, you were trying to solve a problem collaboratively and there are different cues you know, in terms of like, even like dialect and how you speak and things like that, would you, would you see that these same factors would influence how people choose the languages? Okay, thank you for the question. I think, um, so in the paper we actually have quite a bit of the discussion regarding the point you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So here we're thinking there are a few points I want to emphasize based, uh, regarding the sampling of our uh, study. That is all the teams we study here, they are R&D teams doing professional work and they're actually including native speakers who have pretty good fluency level of speaking the sharing language that is English. And also we know all those teams are, all those teams are co-located together and they're install their inside in the institution that use English as the official working language. So I think those boundary condition largely shaped the current finding from this research, which compare with some previous study in the space of organizational science. So for example, they ever studied those uh, geographically distributed team. Then in those teams, people usually feel more um, they feel more comfortable about speaking their native language even at formal meetings. But in an English-speaking institution, we don't see that happen much at formal meeting. It's just happening in formal chat. Yeah, so I think those uh, boundary conditions will be very important to interpret our finding. But again, I think these findings will provide a very interesting guideline to see how much of them can be structured into other type of methods like survey or future interview and to validate it in other type of scenario to see how much it can be extended to other contexts. Thanks for this great question.